My name is John Bene Ramsey and I'm five and a half. Um, I'd probably the first one, in fact, we wanted to make that the title of our book, uh, was uh, No Footprints in the Snow, and that got out there immediately. Uh, and of course, we lived in Colorado, and it was winter, but uh, and I hadn't really noticed. I, remember, I did remember that coming home that evening, there was no snow in the, in the yard or the driveway. Christmas Eve. Christmas mm -hmm. Eve. But then we saw the crime scene photographs that were taken <sighs> early that morning when the police first arrived, and there was no snow. And so that was the, the fact, mm. but the fiction got out, no footprints in snow. And as someone said once, when you, when you have a rumor like that, it's like shouting fire in a theater. As everybody's running out, you can say, ooh, just kidding, but they don't hear that part. Mm. It's, it's too late. And um, that, to me, was probably the, the first thing that got out uh, in the media. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 11 in the Khan's Order series. In this episode we deal with Judge Khan's criticizing people who were capitalizing on and profiting from the widespread interest in John Bonet Ramsey. I've done this episode slightly out of order because I want to focus on this particular aspect of the Khan's order away from sort of the suspects that are highlighted by Lou Smith that sort of came up in the list. I was also going to do this episode split into a YouTube section and a Patreon section but at this point I'm not going to do that. There is bonus content on the John Bonet case. There's actually a very interesting post today on the broken basement window which challenges the entire notion of when it was broken, who broke it and how it broke, uh, which is on Patreon. You can check that out. That's on the $2 tier along with quite a lot of ongoing posts. There's also the Craven Silence audiobook. We up to chapter, I think it's chapter 18 with four chapters to go in the first narrative in the Craven Silence trilogy. Please note I'll be doing a live stream tomorrow at the usual time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I think that is about 7 o'clock in the UK. And I'll be talking a little bit more about the live stream at the end of this episode. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Thank you to, well, I'm not sure if it's 100 or 200 people who've subscribed since the last video, but thank you for your support in getting up to the 33,000 subscriber milestone. Uh, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So I want to jump right in, and we are now on page, still on page 28, and we're dealing with Kahn's assessment of the publicity surrounding the crime. So I'm going to quote immediately from the order. She writes, quote, Beginning on the morning of December 26, 1996, there has been and continues to be considerable public interest and media attention devoted to John Bonet's murder and the subsequent investigation into the crime, end quote. Now, bear in mind, this was written in 2003, and there's since been something like the passage of 18 years, right? And there is still considerable media interest. There are still books being written about the John Bonet Ramsey case. There are still podcasts going up documentaries going up and you know what I think is not that the judge would have known this or could have predicted this but you know there's been quite a lot of intrigue around the case that has come to light afterwards and anytime that happens anytime you have a situation of evidence that was either hidden or people were manipulated into believing something well then the story is going to be breathed new life into it so for example you had the indictments being revealed in 2013, so 10 years after this particular order, right? So that was something that seemed to change the game and certainly changed a lot of the perceptions that were out there. You also had some of the DNA narrative changing. You had the spectacle around John Mark Carr and Mary Keenan, which is something that I just find so ridiculous that I don't even like to talk about. And you'll find there's very little material 
Um, not none, but very little material, certainly on YouTube that I've done covering that stuff. It's just such, such a sideshow. And then, of course, recently you had the documentaries on the 20th anniversary, and you also had Burke Ramsey appearing on Dr. Phil with more revelations there. So Burke Ramsey appears on Dr. Phil and suddenly things change. Suddenly we learn new things, such as that actually was awake and this, that and the next thing. And we're going to come back to Burke Ramsey and Dr. Phil a little bit later in this episode. The point I'm just trying to make is that obviously you can have uh, interest in a case where things are revealed much, much later on. And not only that the case isn't resolved, it is not resolved anywhere near to people's satisfaction. And on top of all of that, there's a sense of the wool being pulled over our eyes. Um, not only by some of the people um, involved in the case, I mean at the center of the case, but also some of the people who were trusted to prosecute the case, trusted to deal with the case in terms of the way law enforcement or prosecution would normally do that. So returning to the Khan's order, she refers to what she's referred to previously and, and continues saying, quote, the Boulder Police Department utilized the press in an attempt to smoke out John Bernays killer. In addition to this intentional use of the press, a number of leaks of confidential information at various stages of the murder investigation served to hamper the ability of the Boulder Police Department to conduct an, inf an effective investigation into crime. I guess it should be into the crime, end quote. So a couple of things there. Um, I think it is a little bit one-sided to say that the Boulder Police utilized the press. What about the Ramses? The Ramses gave press conferences as early as the 1st of um, uh, January 1997, and you can basically say they sort of lobbed the first, or they sort of shot the first missile over the ship's bow, right? They started that whole game of, well, we're going to shape public perception. We're not going to talk to you. Instead, we'll shape public perception. We'll try ourselves in the court of public opinion, right? And then you would have a situation where the Boulder police would indirectly respond to that via leaks. And I think an excellent example of a leak like that was the Bardak report. Um, just that article that she wrote was fantastic. And she was able to write it because of um, leaks and access to the Boulder PD. And, you know, I think Charlie Brennan was one of those who said that the Boulder police leaked like a sieve. Um, and the reason for that was the frustration that, yeah, they were investigating and then nothing was happening. And so they were trying to put pressure on, I guess, the powers that be to smoke out John Bonet's killing. In other words, to force something to happen. And just as in the McCann case, I think the authorities totally underestimated the the metal of these people, um, meaning I think they thought they could, um, you know, twist their arms behind their backs in a psychological sense in terms of media pressure, and then this would cause a, um, a breakdown or something like that. I think that was a massive miscalculation in the McCann case, and I think the same with the Ramses. Um, to some extent, I can understand it with the Ramses because there were three people that were in the house and you could imagine that one of them might crack, whether it was Burke, Patsy or John or some other family member. With the McCanns, um, I think what they miss, what they underestimated was the solidarity of the couple and also the how much they had to lose in terms of they'd worked themselves um, up, they'd pulled themselves up from their, with their bootstraps. How, how does that saying go? They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps from a very um, kind of humble background that worked uh, really, really hard to get where they, where they were. 
And so th there was no way they were going to give up on that. And these were um, people who um, tried very hard to become doctors and they weren't going to give that away after achieving it, right? And the same with the Ramses. The Ramses had achieved, um, built this business and um, come so far. Patsy had overcome cancer. And they weren't just going to um, give up the ground that they'd gained, if that makes sense. John had been fighting, fighting is perhaps the wrong word, but been working his tail off for years to get his company where it was. He didn't want to just throw in the towel on his own story. And I think that is what the Boulder police um, uh, underestimated. What I do think is unfair and one-sided from Judge Carnes is this idea that the Boulder police were doing something and they were exerting pressure and it was totally unfair, right? And there's no... There's no um, uh, sense of well what's the parallel narrative, narrative to that and the parallel narrative to that is both the Ramses themselves kind of making a spectacle of themselves in terms of going almost doing you know like constant publicity for their book in 2000 I don't think anyone got more publicity for their book on the Ramsey case than the Ramses they went on to Barbara Walters they went on to Larry King over two nights uh, they just got, they were given the floor, right? And even so, their, their book isn't really that well received or that well reviewed. The other aspect of all of this is the way the prosecutors and the district attorney, they might not have been the face, their faces may not necessarily have been in the media, although they were. You actually sometimes occasionally see um, the district attorney appearing in a documentary in the same way that you see with the Chris Watts case. Um, district attorneys don't always participate, but he certainly did, I think, in the Dateline um, documentary, I think of, I think, was it 2006? I'm not 100% sure. But there was a Dateline documentary in which um, Alex Hunter did participate. He was interviewed. and But besides that, you had Alex Hunter becoming very close and giving incredible access to tabloid journalists like Jeff Shapiro. And I know when I put a video up about that, there wasn't very much interest in that. People didn't really pay that much attention. And, you know, when I go through that John Bonet series timeline, um, the video about the dog got 7,500 views. The video about Randy Simons and Mark Fix gets 5,000 views. The video about the Santa Bear mystery gets over 5,500 views. The medical records gets over 5,000 views. Um, does John Benet Ramsey's older brother have an alibi? 7,500 views. Um, and then right in the middle of that is the episode about Jeff Shapiro, which is really important. His relationship with Alex Hunter gets the least amount of views. And it shouldn't. So I'm going to put a link to that video in the description. If you haven't watched it, please do. It'll give you some additional background. But I'm just saying when we're talking about Judge Khan sort of berating the Boulder Police Department and then sort of praising either the Ramses and the, um, you know, putting her, her trust in the authority of the district attorney and then sort of reinforcing or... Um, yeah, pro kind of providing reinforcement to her own um, assessment, to her own decision based on the quote-unquote decision of the district attorney not to indict. You kind of get a, a sense that, well, um, not everything is being revealed by the district attorney and that he's playing uh, quite a dangerous game, but he's also playing quite an interesting game behind the scenes. He doesn't need to... Um, stand up and make statements all the time. He can almost control things from a distance. And one of the ways that I think he kept his finger on the pulse of what was going on was by developing a friendship and giving access to tabloid journalists like Jeff Shapiro. And Jeff Shapiro is a pretty smart, um, wily 
uh, journalist is a lawyer today. And a lot of these tabloid journalists were being paid huge amounts of money, which meant they were hugely incentivized to get information, to break scoops, to find exclusives. And so that is exactly what they did. Going back to the Khan's order, she says, in addition to this intentional use of the press, a number of leaks of confidential information at various stages of the murder investigation served to hamper the ability of the Boulder Police Department to conduct an effective investigation into the crime, end quote. Now, I find that quite, quite ironic. Again, it's almost like blaming the Boulder Police for the leaks, which is now hampering the Boulder Police. Isn't it something else? Wasn't it leaks by other people and other entities that is causing... I mean, if you think about it now, how much repeated, how much it is repeated in the media that the reason the Ramsey case never went anywhere is because of the Boulder Police. It's been repeated so many times, it's become cliche. It's become a reality for a lot of people. And it's just not accurate. There were faults of the Boulder Police, certainly. There were problems, certainly. There was a compromised crime scene, certainly. But if you're going to say there was insufficient evidence, that's not true. Just the ransom note on its own and John Monet's body inside the house on its own are big, big clues. And another very big clue is the whole thing of no footprints in the snow. And by the way, the 18th chapter of The Craven Silence deals specifically with this. It deals with the temperatures at that time, which are well known. It deals with the fact that trace snow did fall that night. So you say, well, there's no snow. Well, there was snow. The question is, when did the snow melt? And there's a quite a simple answer to that question. Well, what is the temperature when the officer arrived? What is the temperature when the photographer arrived? It's something that is not a mystery. It's not scientific. It is, we know at what temperature ice or snow melts. And so that's going to give you your answer whether the no footprints in snow is possible and probable or not. So now we go back to the Khan's order, and this is the part that I chose to highlight in the title slide. And I must say it makes me quite, I don't know what the word is, um, irritated is not the word. It just, uh, it riles me to read this sort of thing because it's so one-sided. So she says, quote, finally, Many people have attempted to capitalize on and profit from the widespread interest in John Bonnet's murder. Indeed, the plaintiff, and this is a reference to Chris Wolfe, has attempted to gain a book deal, and the chief theorist behind the plaintiff's claims, former detective Steve Thomas, also wrote a book. End quote. Now, the part that is just crazy about this is you say, okay, so, you know, the people that have tried to capitalize on and profit they are they are the scumbags here they, there's something wrong with them um, there's something opportunistic right well ultimately chris wolf never wrote a book and ultimately steve thomas wrote a book well he was the lead investigator and he lost his job and by the way you have another parallel with that exact same thing in the mccann case you have the lead detective fired and then he loses his job And he doesn't really work again for the police. And then he writes a book. And then he's sued for the book that he writes as well. And the book that he writes paints a totally different picture about what has happened and what is going on than what you've heard otherwise. And so what is quite interesting in the McCann Lee Detectives book and the book from uh, Steve Thomas is you get a sense of another side to the suspects and also another side to the the sort of the corridors of power that the strange um, almost like mirage that is going on in the corridors of power you sort of think that's a bit strange why aren't you doing this why didn't that happen etc etc there's nothing inaccurate about the judge saying this but i think to be accurate you also had Detective Lou Smith participating in a book as well. And he died before the book was published. So so why are you now um why are you now fingering Detective Thomas as the um 
as the sort of problem, right? The, the Ramses wrote, ended up writing two books, which heavily involve, it's kind of, they're trying to exonerate themselves, justify themselves in the books that they've written, and then also point the finger to others that they think could be involved, right? Um, there's also indirect ways that you could say money may have been made. For example, um, there was the sale of, I think, the police records. I can't remember if it was Jamison who, so, who sold them, but there's something like that, and then they were sold for $40,000. And I think the real question you've got to ask is how did that happen? Who got access to it? Because bear in mind, in a scenario where a case might go to trial, you know, access is given to the discovery. And one of the preconditions the Ramses gave for the 1997 police interview was give us all the discovery. Now, if you've got the discovery, that has certain value. You know, you could sell some of it to the tabloids, especially the stuff that suits you. I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying it does happen. And so the other thing I want to bring up, which I think is very interesting and very difficult to be absolutely certain about is, um, you know, so we're talking about um, this whole idea that someone tried to capitalize on and profit from the interest in John Bonnet's murder. And then on the 20 year anniversary, Burke Ramsey goes on to Dr. Phil and, you know, he gives him a lot of his time. They, I think it's two days that it was done. Um, his father appears on the show. Uh, their lawyer appears on the show. They are given some footage that we have never seen before, including um, the interviews of Burke as a, as a small boy that, that I don't think we'd ever seen that before. And so in that video, we are in a, in a situation where what is happening here, um, they are telling their story, but um, w was Burke Ramsey paid for that interview? And we know that he was. You know, that, that has been documented across a lot of media. So yeah, you have the, the judge saying, wow, you know, all these opportunists have capitalized on and profited from the interest. Well, what about the Ramseys themselves? You know, it almost seems anathema to suggest that. And that's what I'm doing. I'm saying, you know, didn't the Ramses ever make any money out of the interest in the, their daughter? And, you know, I know they set up a fund. Um, there was a, a questioner, a person questioning John Ramsey on Larry King saying, you know, are you still taking donations for John Bonet kind of thing? Um, but besides that, when I say this, I have it in my, my head. I don't know how I got it in my head. Um, I did Google and I did go through some of my, my research and my records. I can't find the information. I might be able to find it at a later date. But for some reason, I've got the figure $20 million in my head that, that uh, Burke Ramsey may have been paid. Now, as I I can't um, prove it. I, I can't even remember where where I got that information or whether I've imagined it, but I seem to remember reading somewhere that it was twenty million dollars. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I'm mistaken. But if if um, if it wasn't twenty million, I'm sure it was a sizable sum for Burke Ramsey to come out of hiding essentially for the first time ever, and then to go back into hiding. You know, it had to have been something that I think he would have felt would be worth his while. And the the Dr. Phil show was a big spectacle. Like I said, there was quite a lot of effort that went into that show. It wasn't just a one-off, a one-day thing. It was a three-part show. And there was, um, there, there was definitely a lot of archival footage used. But besides all that, you had Dr. Phil going to the trouble to set up kind of a studio a home, a place that felt like the inside of the Ramsey home, even though it wasn't. And so a lot of effort went into that that episode. And you might say, you know, I don't think Burke was paid a lot or I don't think it was 20 million or, or whatever. But the fact is Dr. Phil earns around about $95 million a year. So if you had to ask, um, you know, would he be able to afford a sizable sum 
20 million, 10 million, whatever the amount was? The answer is yes. In fact, you could say of all the talk show hosts, the one that could afford it the most would be Dr. Phil. The other thing that I want to mention is this was an incredibly sought after interview on the 20 year anniversary. And in the end, I think it was quite a self justifying interview. It was sort of apologia. The whole idea was that Burke, Dr. Phil basically endorsed Burke, ultimately basically said, I think he's innocent, I believe him, uh, he, he, the way he smiles, whatever. And you can kind of imagine that if he went into a sort of a hostile interview that he wouldn't want to participate, right? So it, wasn't it in the, their mutual interest to do? But I think the bottom line is, you know, if you're talking about Many people have attempted to capitalize on and profit from the widespread interest in John Bonnet's murder. Well, isn't that exactly what that show was? It was on the 20th anniversary. It was the most sought after interview of, of all of the Ramsey um, suspects or the people involved. And Dr. Phil sort of got it. And he was, he was if you listen to that interview, you hear about you hear the way that he talks about the widespread interest in it, you know, that and how um, Burke Ramsey has never spoken before and how everyone wants to know what Burke says. So so can you see this whole thing that Khan seems to be wanting to lay at the door of Boulder PD? Boulder PD leaked this, Boulder PD leaked that, the lead detective did this. Um, but what about the other side of the story? So just another thing I want to bring up is let's assume just for the sake of argument that Burke was paid, say, $20 million. I think you can just imagine if we speculate, you can imagine if he receives $20 million, right, even if it was $10 million, whatever the amount was, the next thing, the CBS documentary uh, appears on television, then that gets shut down. And then suddenly there's a lot of money in the war chest to take CBS to court. There's suddenly a lot of money that a lawyer can sort of say, well, look, uh, can you put me on retainer and and, and then we'll go after CBS? Oh, okay, I will. Uh, By the way, I've just gotten some money that we can use for that exact purpose. Oh, great. And so very shortly after the Dr. Phil interview, there's suddenly a, a brand new legal sweep intended to sweep CBS kind of under the carpet, that documentary. And big numbers are mentioned, you know, a $750 million lawsuit against CBS. And then also a $150 million lawsuit against uh, one of the participants in that show. And who who do you think is going to be really um, eager to sign his name to go after all of these people? And, And who and what do you think is going to pay for it? Well, Lynn Wood was, was the lawyer, or his client, was Burke Ramsey. Where did Burke Ramsey get the, the money to pay for, for Lynn Wood to represent him against a massive network like that? And so what I love about Judge Carnes is she dismisses and undermines the opportunistic book written by Steve Thomas, doesn't really refer to... Too much of what's in there, although, of course, a lot of it is trying to pin the blame on Patsy Ramsey, which which isn't the, the best part of his book. Um, but then you have the other side of it, which is that she then goes into the Ramsey's book and basically kind of gives it a stamp of approval. You know what? Uh, the Ramsey's thought Holgoth could have done it, right? And it could also have been Gary Oliva. And this kind of sort of... Um, absolutely unambiguous she's sort of supporting their theory as well this makes sense well there was a lot in steve thomas's book that made sense as well so interestingly the judge then comes back to sort of reality in a way and on page 31 she says quote in addition to authoring the book defendants have appeared on various news programs meaning the ramses On March 24th, 2000, the defendants appeared on NBC's Today Show, a television broadcast in a segment taped in February 2000 with Katie Couric. It is from this broadcast that plaintiff's slander claim arises. So it's actually from something that appeared on television that 
Chris Wolf really paid attention and said, well, this is not right, right? The Ramsey's appearing on television and talk, mentioning his name effectively. The order goes on to say, quote, defendants did not have any influence or control over the visuals displayed when they spoke. We're not told that a photograph of plaintiff would be displayed during the appearance on the show and we're not told before taping what specific questions would be posed to them during the taping, end quote. So they can really wash their hands and say, well, you know, we accuse Chris Watts, we, Chris Watts, we, we accuse Chris Wolf in our book, but we had no idea that a television show would say anything about that. Hand wash, right? Then it goes on to say, in other words, defendants had, had no editorial control over how the interview was edited or presented. Mr. Ramsey said that, I can tell you when we first started looking at one particular lead early on, my reaction was, this is it. This is the killer. And our investigator said, whoa. So th this is really um, quite interesting is John Ramsey in the episode is trying to draw the public's attention to someone. And then when they do draw the attention to someone then, and it's Chris Wolf, and he says, hey, how can you be, uh, you know, highlighting me, right? And he is mentioned, he's the number one suspect on that list of five in their book. And so when people do go and join the dots and, and try and question this character, then they said, well, we didn't say his name on the show. Can you see, it's quite cleverly done. It's done with a bit of stagecraft and sleight of hand. What I do think is quite a good defense is saying, well, you know what? Those statements we made weren't in relation to the plaintiff. It was actually to Michael Helgoth. Although his photograph was being superimposed on the telecast by NBC, um, I think what they mean there is that his photo wasn't actually on the television. So what do you think? Was that a misdirection saying, OK, well, we're going to say it in this way and then if we get into trouble, we can just say, well, we didn't know who you were going to think it might be. Then Judge Carnes goes on to say, for his part, meaning Chris Wolfe, he too appeared before the media and profited from discussing and critiquing the murder investigation. In 1997, plaintiff voluntarily gave an interview to Hard Copy, a syndicated television program in which he claimed to be a suspect in the murder of John Bonan, for which he received $5,000 compensation. In addition, the plaintiff discussed his status as a suspect with the news tabloid The National Enquirer and received $250, not $250,000, just $250, for that interview. In addition, plaintiff provided information to Lauren Schiller for use in his 1998 book about the murder entitled Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. In several passages attributed to the plaintiff, the latter discusses his arrest and interrogation by the Boulder Police Department. Plaintiff also attempted to capitalize on his association with a murder investigation through a book deal. On plaintiff's computer was a letter dated March 2nd, 1999 address to David Granger of Esquire magazine discussing his status as a suspect. The latter requests a generous fee in return for plaintiff authoring a book about John Bonet's murder. Plaintiff's counsel, Donna Hoffman, also became interested in the case early in the murder investigation as, and has contributed to the continued media interest through the filing of various lawsuits. So now you even have the lawyer who is uh, accused of trying to profit out of it. I don't know how many lawyers haven't. I don't know how many lawyers haven't written books about high-profile cases that they were associated with. Anyway, we're going to pick up on Judge Carnes's criticism of Donna Hoffman in episode 12 of this series. As I said at the beginning of this episode, I'm going to be doing a live stream tomorrow at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. That is nine o'clock in South Africa, about seven o'clock in the UK, and I think about 5 a.m. in Australia, I guess depending where you are in Australia. Um, and the topics we're going to discuss are the royal family. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I thought of the very high profile interview that Oprah gave or, or Oprah did with Meghan and Harry. I'm going to share some of my personal insights uh, because Harry, of course, has come to South Africa quite a few times. And I also went to the UK 
1997, 8, 9. And then I'll be doing an episode on Sarah Everhard, uh, a young woman, 33-year-old marketing executive that uh, was recently killed in Britain uh, and uh, it's becoming quite a high-profile case. It certainly captured the hearts of a lot of folks in England and I'm going to be talking about that in due course. The final thing I want to mention is in my previous video on Shanann Watts, I made a mistake. I assumed that the video footage of, or not video footage, the photos of Shanann on a, at a Thrive event was from her going to um, Arizona because that is how the Netflix documentary characterized it. They provided a timeline, they provided the, the text from that particular weekend. But it actually turned out that those photos come from a trip she did, I think, in February to Las Vegas. So I apologize for the error. So I hope you guys are enjoying your weekend. I will be showing those of you who tune into the live tomorrow. A, um, a newly groomed Timmy is just had a huge haircut. And so he's going to be looking very different to the way that you've gotten used to him. So that's something to look forward to. So I'll see you guys tomorrow at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for the live. We'll be talking about the Royals. We'll be talking about Chris Watts. We'll be talking about Laurie Vallow and possibly also Sarah Everhard. And if there are any questions about the Ramsey case, I'll take those as well. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.